Good morning and welcome to the 31st meeting of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2023. Our first agenda item is taking a decision to take business in private and our members content to take item six in private. Thank you very much. Our second agenda item is to take evidence on a series of reports regarding the Scottish Government's commitment to align with the European Union where appropriate. These reports include a draft of the Scottish Government's 2023 annual report on use of the keeping pace power within the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Act Scotland 2021. And we are joined this morning by Angus Robertson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. And with him this morning is George McPherson, Head of EU Policy and Alignment at the Scottish Government, and Lorraine Walkinshaw, Scottish Government Legal Director. It can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a, it says here, short opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, on Europe Day on the 9th of May, I reiterated the Scottish Government's commitment to its European Union alignment policy and to providing further information to support the Parliament's scrutiny rule on this subject. Government policy has not changed, even in face of the retained EU Law Act with its divergent and deregulatory intent. We will continue to seek to align with the European Union where appropriate. And that means where it is possible and where it is meaningful, meaningful for us to do so. The standards set by the European Union will continue to influence many of the policy frameworks and initiatives which we are developing domestically. And today I'm pleased to provide evidence to the committee. The new annual report improves the transparency of ministerial decision making and increases the amount of information provided. This reporting includes our draft annual report on use of the power to align as required by the UK withdrawal from the European Union Continuity Scotland Act 2021 laid in Parliament on the 31st of October. As you know, since the committee response to last year's draft report on the Continuity Act, officials have been working to expand and centralise the process of managing and sharing information regarding alignment decisions. And I want to thank parliamentary clerks for joint work with my officials so we can provide the information needed by Parliament to carry out its scrutiny function. My letter of the 31st of October to the committee confirms the details of the extended approach that has been implemented starting in July. Our expanded reporting demonstrates the complexity of taking alignment decisions and the need for a proportionate approach in that alignment is not always possible as Scotland is no longer part of the structures to which much of EU law relates. We're also constrained by the limitations of the devolution settlement and of course the willingness of the UK government to respect it. I'd like to mention the independent research commissioned by the committee and carried out by Queen's University and I agree with its core findings that, and I quote, the Scottish Government's commitment to align with developments in EU law has been largely upheld and that, I quote again, there has been no significant divergence between Scots law and EU law. I also agree with the report's conclusion that minor technical divergence will accumulate over time. Mindful of this, the Scottish Government's approach includes careful consideration of ongoing technical developments within the European Union including via tertiary legislation as well as other instruments. This is illustrated in our expanded annual reporting, although this year's report only reflects the part of the year where our updated processes have been in operation. As outlined in my letter from the 3rd of September, when Scottish Government legislation is laid in the Scottish Parliament, information will now be included in policy notes and relevant memoranda for bills to assist with scrutiny. And in the future, our reports will cover a full year, be based on the same reporting period as that of the Continuity Act, namely from the 1st of September to the 31st of August. I'd welcome discussion between officials regarding the feasibility of sharing the track of material produced by Dr. Witten in a time frame that would allow us to coordinate consideration of its conclusions within our analysis of current EU proposals. I hope our revised reporting and these comments are helpful in considering how the Scottish Government is implementing its alignment policy, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, and um, uh, I, I 
I certainly welcome the, the reports. I think it's been um, really useful to see the level of detail that we, we now have available to us. Um, in your letter, um, you did uh, agree with Dr Whitten's assessment in our EU law tracker report that a degree of diversion is, is a risk that will likely occur cumulatively, potentially becoming significant in the future. Could you just expand on the challenges the Scottish Government have in that respect? Um, and um, what would be the significant implications of regulatory divergence with businesses seeking to trade with the EU and in the internal market, including Northern Ireland, of course? Have <coughs> well, the position. first thing I would say during this particular, I think we all understand this is quite a technical um, uh, uh, area. So I think we're we're all very grateful to have the support of, of committee advi clerks and advisors. And in my case, my my civil service colleagues here and a, <coughs> a wider team. So if any of them are wanting to, to illustrate the points that I'm making in generality with any specifics, I'd be be grateful for uh, any additions <coughs> any additions to it. I mean, the first thing that I would I would say is we're seeking to remain aligned with the European Union um, where it is appropriate to do so. And that, using phrases like that, where it is appropriate, where it is possible, where it is meaningful, matters. We're, we're not in the European Union, so we're trying to find our best way, using a variety of different approaches, to make sure that we can <coughs> remain aligned, working in parallel with the European uh, Union. So. You know, we will do that within devolved competence, and we will do that to implement measures that have demonstrable effect. There are areas, perhaps, where it is unlikely that there would be demonstrable effect, and there are areas where um, measures relate to European Union um, organisations that we're not a part of, uh, or they may um, be involved in particular uh, areas where there, there is not a legal locus here. And so that, that's why it's, it's, it is literally impossible to remain, to do 100% of that which the European Union is, is doing in terms of its policy, because we are not in the European Union. Now, that having been said, we are going to do everything that we can uh, to maintain the standards of the European Union, its values and its strategic approach uh, to things. Uh, we have a resource both in the Scottish Government here, but also in Scotland House in Brussels, and I think a good number of the committee have been there, so I think you know how competent the team is, um, and in coordination are going to make sure that we are best able to provide to you and through you to the likes of business convener an understanding of um, which legislation does have an impact and what we are going to be doing and I think everybody in the committee understands the reporting mechanisms that have now been brought into train so that one is aware when measures are being introduced how alignment is, is, um, is going to be achieved. So I think, we're in a, I think we're in a much, much better place. And I'm pleased I gave, I gave the, the committee a commitment. There's been quite a few changes on the committee so that some colleagues may not have heard that. Um, having spent 10 years on the European Scrutiny Committee at, at Westminster, where every single week we were going through uh, European Union proposals. And so I understand, having sat in that chair, quite literally, uh, what it is that you, I think, require to be able to be satisfied that you are able to scrutinise what the Scottish Government is doing in relation to um, alignment. But I think there is an appreciation that this has the potential to be a massive undertaking. And so what we're trying to do is find a balance in reporting uh, the legislation, the policy, the strategy of um, the European Union and how we are seeking to remain aligned so that you can keep us, uh, you can apply scrutiny uh, to what we are doing, but, but have, a, have a, a, a balance between something that is then unwieldy and too technical, where too much can perhaps be lost in detail, um, but to give you everything that you require. And as I said before, this is the first published iteration, and if there's something that you feel that you require more of, less of, or differently, we are very open to hearing that, and I know that my colleagues and, and the committee clerks have been working closely to make sure that we are 
providing the reporting, reporting me um, method to a standard that is, is, is appropriate to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to move to questions from the committee. Um, bring in Mark Russell. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks very much. Um, can I just go back to your point then about you know, what we'd like to see more of? Um, I, mean, I do welcome the improvements to the, um, to the report that have been brought in this year. But if I turn to Annex B, we've got a, a useful table here. It talks about the, you know, the title of the European law, the issue, subject issue that's at stake, and then current alignment consideration. But under current alignment consideration from the Scottish Government, you know, there's a kind of number of statements here. You know, it's either on, under active consideration, uh, you know, proposals under development. So there's, there, there's some kind of indication of the direction of travel it doesn't really say kind of where we are exactly within the policy process. So if I take an example, uh, nature restoration law coming in at European level will establish legally binding targets, says it's under development in Scotland, but we know that that will probably be wrapped into the environment bill. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering to what extent we can get more clarity there. I think it's partly in the context of common framework. So we've obviously had issues around common frameworks in relation to deposit return scheme. There's an issue there around transparency. So I feel that there's perhaps a little bit more granularity in terms of you know, what the conversation looks like across the UK. Are there implications in terms of IMA? Um, but also just kind of you know, beyond the general, yes, we broadly agree with this and we're kind of working on something. Is there more that could be put into that section to kind of show the government's working in terms of where we are at the moment in terms of alignment and what a committee should look out for going forward and it might be this committee it might be another committee yeah well well can i say i mean i think that's a committee working in action isn't it so we what we are doing is we are providing the context for the work that we are doing so we are aware of these pro proposals we are assessing those proposals we are considering what it is that we um, what we would wish to do to remain aligned and, and what implications that might have in, in the, the, con the wider context that Mr Ruskell um, uh, has outlined. And th that then leads to exactly these kind of questions being able to be asked. Now, I, I can't be psychic, uh, nor can my colleagues, in knowing, because it's a very long list, and what might, you know, there, there may be something that's not tremendously interesting at all to anybody, um, but there may be things that for some members, given the variety of interests that you have, that these are really burning issues for you. And now, because we've been able to highlight, here are the things that are on the docket, so to speak, um, that if you have follow-up questions, um, if you want to ask in writing, or if there are things of such import that you would wish me and um, and colleagues to give evidence, we can. But, but here's another aspect to this, is um, the information that we're providing is also, it's also being done in such a way that the subject committees of the Scottish Parliament, who have a particular locus in different policy areas, can go, oh, well, these, for the, the example that Mr. Uh, Ruskell has given, these in environmental considerations should be considered in the round by the Scottish Parliament Committee that deals with environmental and, and related matters. Um, and, and that is what we're hoping this process makes easier. So, um, and I don't think it's for me to, to, to sit here and, and, and outline, you know, specific, mm -hmm. you know, in relation to specific bits of European legislation today. But what this is, the start of, is the start of a process of giving you the opportunity to make sure that your committee colleagues and other committees are aware that there are there is this proposal that proposal this should be looked at perhaps more closely um, or you would wish more between uh, evidence sessions us to provide you more as part of your uh, work as a, a as a committee and if you feel that you require more information about that and, and how that then uh, links together with with other areas then that's, I think, how the process is supposed to work. So I think Mr. Ruskell is actually making the point. This, this is the point of this, which is to, to help you have an awareness of what has happened and what we've done with that, what is currently being considered, and what we know is coming down the track and we need to think more about. And I would hope that notwithstanding the fact that we're no longer in the European Union, there are still ways in which we can make our views known to EU colleagues, 
um, around uh, certain measures. So I think also a little bit of horizon scanning is also quite useful in this regard. And that's what I hope can emerge from this reporting mechanism that will be able to do all of that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just a slightly uh, more granular information there would be good because, you know, many of the boxes just are subject to further consideration. What mm -hmm. does that mean? So if there was something that related to PFG commitments or something yep. else in there or a particular common framework, that might be useful in just signposting it. Yep. Um, I was also just going to ask about the, the decision, I think it was in, that was captured in last year's report to diverge from the EU in relation to building standards for electric vehicles, uh, car parking, I think it was, and just whether there's any kind of then backward look at those decisions. So obviously that was a decision that was made. Um, but is there a point where you go back and say, well, okay, is that working? Uh, you know, what kind of progress are we seeing in the EU with the rollout of electric vehicle charging um, at public car parks? And is that something for us to then reconsider? So is it now, you know, once we make a decision, that's it, we've diverged, thanks very much. Or is it a point where you go back and you say, well, hang on a minute, you know, in terms of keeping pace, was this the right decision? Uh, you know, is there a policy impact there? Okay, so I'll answer the second bit, and I'll ask uh, George McPherson to come in in, in the first part, and if he's got any subsequent um, 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 things to mention in relating to the, the car charging point. I think that also is an issue where, in my mind, I really hope that our subject committees in the Parliament, who have an awareness of what has, has come through the European Union uh, institutions, how the Scottish Government has sought to align, and then, as they would do with anything else, then ask themselves after some time, is this working as intended? That's how, that's how this is supposed to work. Um, now, if that's not working, um, then we need to work out why. Um, but on something like that, I mean, that is where the scrutiny committee of, of committees are absolutely, that is at the heart of the responsibility of, of, of committees' work. If you don't have enough information, ask for it. If you want ministers to come and give evidence about specific measures, do that. And in the meantime, if there are technical issues or you know, subjects that are lie very close to, the, to one member rather than the committee as a whole, again, please raise them with us and we will, we will deal with that in the usual way. Sorry, George, I didn't want to... Yeah, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, what I would add to that, I think, is um, obviously it's quite a new process. Um, we've only had a, a small number of months of information gathered centrally in which to produce the reports from. Um, so the Annex C, which currently identifies EU uh, proposals that the Scottish Government is, is considering and the view that we've reached on it so far, uh, in future years that will be a, a full year's worth of reporting. Um, and subsequent reports... Um, will contain, I, I would imagine, the, the current position in terms of those proposals. Looking back, you can compare the reports to see how that's changed over the period of time. Also, when the Scottish Government takes action to align with those particular proposals, then that will be captured in the report wherever it is, is, is most, most relevant. Um, so I think this is partly due to the fact that it's quite, quite a new report. Um, However, that particular proposal, I believe, will, will be captured in, in Annex C uh, as it's considered going forward. And uh, as I said, it can then be referred back to. OK. Yep. OK. Um, Mr Cameron. Uh, th thank you. Good morning to the Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Um, I think uh, I, I would agree with your comments at the start of your statement about uh, the work that this, the committee here and its clerks have done in terms of... Mm -hmm. um, at, you know, the EU law tracker, etc. I, I think it is worth making the observation that, um, you know, this is Scottish government policy and the committee's correct role is to scrutinise that and it should be the Scottish government that is leading the way in the kind of work around tracking EU law, etc. And the committee should be reacting to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is, I think, a slight sense that it's been the wrong way around uh, previously. Um, and I think we are beginning to correct that, but I just would like to put that on the record. Um, welcome any observations you have on it uh, in a moment. Can I ask specifically about the uh, point that was made in Dr. Witten's report, where um, uh, um, we wrote to you on the 14th of September asking for your response, uh, and that is changes in tertiary EU law 
and measures contained in the 15 primary UK Acts, which make provisions in areas previously within EU competence, uh, as well as provisions which otherwise arise because of UK withdrawal from the EU. I don't think that those were in the annual report. I may be wrong. But is it possible, either now or at a later date, for, for you or your officials to give an update on those two points? So I'll, I'll answer the first part of um, Don Cameron's question, and then um, there will be some um, updating on, the, on the, the second point of his questioning. On the first point, I, I, I absolutely acknowledge that in the absence of a reporting mechanism, there's an imbalance of understanding, knowledge, and, and information um, that the committee found itself in. We were, um, <clears throat> uh, and from the first instance in which this was a subject to discussion with me before the committee, I think I have always said that I, 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 I acknowledge that, uh, and I want, I, I want to be as helpful as I can be, and have always explained my own personal experience in having had to do this, frankly coming from the other end of the, of the spectrum, where every week, the European Scrutiny Co Committee in the UK Parliament had a sheaf of papers this thick, and that, had, that was after a sift by four legal advisers, all of whom were former UK ambassadors. Um, so the, the volume of material that um, can be um, scrutinised um, is enormous. And I think the real um, aim in where we are trying to get to. This is the first attempt uh, of, a, uh, uh, of providing a mechanism which should point you all towards what we have done, what we are considering, and what we expect to be coming down the line, I, I think is a really good start, because where there will be areas where one wants more information, one will be aware of the ground that, that perhaps you previously did not. So I, I totally agree, and I hope we do get the balance right. And that's why I, I say it again. If there's, if there's more than is required, less, or things in a slightly different format, let's try and make that work. I mean, but I hope there is an appreciation that this is a very, um, it's a very genuine um, attempt by the government to, um, to uh, work with the committee um, for the benefit of, of better lawmaking and scrutiny, um, and um, um, we are open to any feedback about what needs to change in relation to uh, that mechanism. But it's at a start; it's just starting. So I think we can give it a chance to bed in, and then um, and then have an iterative approach as we go forward. On the tertiary law points, George, is there anything that you want to add there? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we, we don't differentiate in the reporting um, between types of EU legislation. So the, the tertiary legislation is captured uh, in our reporting as well. Um, for this particular set of reports, the reporting is, as, as we've said, for a shorter period. Um, so there's not a direct read across in terms of some of the items that Dr. Witten has highlighted in her report, because it was prior to us uh, identifying and, and collating this information centrally. That's not to say necessarily that uh, those items might not have already been considered, um, but it, we don't have the information for the periods that go out with um, the, the change in the process that we have now implemented. That said, I believe that we picked up most of the items that Dr Witten flagged in her report, um, and I think the one that we did not pick up on, I think, is to do with how we aggregated the information. Um, so I, that sort of highlights, I think, that there will always be differences, I think, in terms of how Dr Whitten identifies something as being relevant to uh, devolution in Scotland and the Scottish Government's um, alignment commitment, um, and, and there will be a difference in terms of how that is, is looked at by ourselves. Um, obviously, next year's report will be for a full year. A direct read across will be easier to make. Um, and, uh, you know, as the Cabinet Secretary said in his, his opening statement, um, we'd be, uh, well, we would welcome discussions at official level, at least, um, around how we could potentially um, align better, if you pardon the pun, in terms of how we look at these commitments. Um, uh, there was also the, uh, also just to note as well that Dr Whitten highlighted the point that the Cabinet Secretary did as well, and that is that 
the committee might want to think about speaking to subject matter committees about particular issues themselves. Um, so again, uh, considering our coordination role in, in that part. Thank you. That's very helpful indeed. Um, I'd like to ask a specific question about gene, gene editing. Um, and I, um, I don't want to get into the pros and cons of gene editing. I don't think it's appropriate for this committee to. Uh, and I should also refer to uh, my register of interests uh, in terms of farming and crofting. Uh, but it's quite an interesting area because it is potentially uh, somewhere where Scotland could find itself as a bit of an outlier, given that uh, in the UK Parliament, I think in, in the EU, they have legislated to an extent to allow uh, gene editing, and, and the Scottish Government has been uh, opposed to it. Um, could I just ask, I note in your report that you say that you are now looking carefully at what the EU is doing. Um, could I ask what, what the current position of the Scottish Government is on this? I, I, I would have to furnish uh, Mr Cameron with some advice from, from Cabinet colleagues who have primary responsibility for that. I mean, I think this is, this is where there is one of the dangers in um, having a report which has a myriad of listings of uh, different uh, legislative proposals. If one wants, you know, to pick one out of the hat and you know draw attention to one and ask questions, but I mean, I want to be able to provide Mr. Cameron with the answer to his question, but I'm not in a position to do that. That's entirely fair enough. I mean, I think just as an example, it's quite an interesting uh, example of where, where Scotland is diverging both from uh, the rest of the UK and also arguably from from what the EU is doing so I just as a, as a kind of just as a specific example that is quite uh, sort of I think quite fascinating but that in itself is a, a, a case and obviously that's uh, mr. Cameron is is describing that in his his own terms which he, he is perfectly entitled to do but it just seems to me an excellent example as was the previous example of mr. Russell with an, an interest in environmental legislation where um, my uh, government colleagues who have a responsibility in rural affairs or in in the environmental portfolio area I think um, will be very pleased to answer questions about these specific areas. And that's why, I mean, I've always taken the view as somebody who's worked very, very closely to European Union-related issues as a parliamentarian since 2001, that there has been a danger that things related to the EU are viewed by government in general as being an issue that is dealt with by European colleagues as opposed to understanding these are central issues right across government. Um, and that's why, to, um, uh, to mirror the point that was made before, this is where I would be very keen, although you know, it's your business to work out how you will impress on that with your other um, committee colleagues, that they uh, take as, as close an interest on... I mean, it's not to say that you can't as a committee uh, either convener, but I think both of these examples, whether on the environmental or on the rural side of things, are things that now that we have been able to identify in the report as things that have happened, are happening or will be happening, that we maybe need to know more about it and need to be more conscious about that. I think that's absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Ms Forbes? Thanks very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Coming off the back, perhaps going back to Mark, Ruskell's questions on areas where we haven't aligned and then retrospectively considering that. I wanted to look at how the government is defining that word of where appropriate in terms of alignment in the statement of policy. Of course, it says in a manner that contributes towards maintaining and advancing standards, protecting health and well-being, maintaining our international standards, none of which anyone would uh, disagree with. But I wondered if you could unpack a little bit of how the government is interpreting that appropriateness and who's the final arbiter of that. Because I imagine that there are two principal reasons where it may not be appropriate to align. First is where we're bound by UK law, and it would be therefore unlawful for us to uh, deviate from um, EU standards. And then secondly, perhaps where it might significantly disadvantage our citizens for, for whatever reason, um, either because we're uh, trying to compete in an EU market, but also in a UK market and so on. And I just wondered if you could um, outline that, fully understanding that if we were a 
part of the EU, these questions wouldn't even emerge. We wouldn't have to define appropriateness. So I have already said to the uh, committee uh, a little bit earlier that I think that there are um, there are um, two particular um, uh, constraints um, or realities around which our, our commitment um, uh, operates. Firstly, is the reality of our devolved competence uh, and then the wider UK structures. Um, and secondly, whether measure, European Union measures have demonstrable effect. So to take an example, which I think should be quite easy, um, is in a country where, unless somebody can correct me, I don't think we grow olives, uh, or we don't have a uh, we don't have a, a, a wine sector, as in a wine growing sector, um, where there is European Union legislation on olive growing uh, or wine production, um, that that does not have an effect. Um, so. There are things which are just very obviously things that are within devolved competence, do have demonstrable effect here, and do not have a disadvantage. Um, and around those realities, the consideration needs to be given as to what we're doing. Were we in the European Union, then that would be entirely different, because then everything is from a, a, a legislative standpoint and a, tr and a treaty obligation, a requirement to ensure that one um, is fully integrating the entire corpus of EU uh, law. Um, and we have already inherited 47 years worth of that um, uh, in, in Scotland. So, I mean, I think Ms Forbes' point is absolutely correct. The, it, there is not a 100% read across, notwithstanding the commitment to remain aligned. But I think for anybody who understands uh, how the European Union works, the fact that we're now not in the European Union, um, that there are going to be areas because it does not have direct impact on us or because of the nature of the devolved settlement and how that then works, um, that there has to be um, I mean, if one wants to call it a caveat, then a caveat, um, which is around appropriateness, possibility. I mean, I mean, I've written down a few of these, and you know, they are there for a reason, um, which is, you know, we are not going to be incorporating things that have no impact here, um, uh, or that the constraints are such that we cannot. But that shouldn't detract from the fact that, in the main we are going to do exactly that which we've intended to do, which is to remain aligned. Is there anything from a sort of administrative point of view, George, in terms of somebody who's at the sharp end of making that decision? <clears throat> um, I think there's a particular example in the report um, related to regulations around citrus growing. Um, Scotland does not have a citrus industry. I think that's the only example I'd mention. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the examples you've given are, um, in a sense, very commonsensical. They make a lot of common sense. Where might there be some dubiety? Is there? Is the default to say that we align and therefore a case has to be made for not aligning? Uh, and is that, do you take each one on, on merit and discuss that? Or are there any areas where there is a bit of a grey area? where the, the, the Cabinet or government needs to consider whether there's an alternative route? So, I mean, my default position is the um, we should before we shouldn't, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, the policy of this government is that we wish to see Scotland rejoin the European Union and to do so as quickly as possible. And, um, uh, and I look forward to publishing the Scottish Government's paper on this very subject uh, tomorrow. Um, but I think anybody who understands how European Union accession works is that there's a requirement for candidate countries to show that they um, are ready to, to join. And in significant part, that is because there is an alignment between candidate countries and the standards of the European Union. So us remaining aligned uh, with the European Union is absolutely key to the speediest 
um, rejoining of the European Union, which is our, which is our stated aim. So m my position would be uh, that we should be, wherever we can, seeking to align, and there needs to be a very, very good reason why we shouldn't. But I think Ms Forbes makes the point. I mean, in, in, in significant part, it's just very common sense. I'm not, I'm not aware, I will go away and I will refer to colleagues about this later, about where, where are there issues that may may have been on, on, on the cusp of things. But that, I don't have anything at the forefront of my mind that falls into that category. Will there be? Um, no doubt. Um, but I am, I'm not aware of any at the, the present time that are of particular import. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm a wee bit conscious of time, folks. So if we could just um, try and be succinct in questions and answers, that would be helpful. Mr Stewart. Thank you, convener. Uh, Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. You've talked about the approach the government is taking, uh, the competence, the effects and some of the scrutiny, and, and I think these are all very valid in, in this process. Uh, but can I ask about how the, the Scottish Parliament's EU law tracker has supported uh, the government's approach to alignment uh, and whether uh, the government has reflected on some of that, depending on when you've touched this morning about some sectors and some business organisations and how they manage to cooperate in that process? It's a good question. I mean, there, there, are, there are quite a number of different uh, sources that can be used as part of um, EU tracking mechanisms. And these are very, very common in Brussels. I think everybody knows about the scale of um, representative organisations and, 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 you know, embassies and, um, and offices. And, and, you know, Scot Scotland has its own... Um, a capacity and representation there that can rely on all of these. So I would, I, I would hope that our process is um, as informed as is possible by um, those tracking um, providers uh, that do so in the, the best, most useful way. And you know, the work that um, is conducted in the Scottish Parliament is is an important part of that. I think. We will only know if we're um, if we're missing anything um, as we go through a, a number of rounds of this reporting mechanism, <clears throat> and where colleagues, or the clerks, um, or academics can then point to ways in which other tracking mechanisms have perhaps caught something or not, and then work out whether we've been able to do uh, so as well as we can. Um, I mean, it is a major industry in Brussels to make sure that everybody is aware of what's happening. Um, and um, we, we will avail ourselves of the best information that we can both there and here. And I think, as you will know from your own deliberations, there are some extremely talented uh, academics and specialists in the field who, who work on this day and daily. And they also par form part of a wider ecosystem of, of flagging up what is happening, what's coming, the import of things. We just have to make sure that we're, we're capturing all of that. Yeah? yeah? yeah. And, and one specific area, if I can talk about, you know, Europe fit for the digital age has been discussed in the past. Uh, and uh, Scotland has ambitions about trying to ensure that it has uh, the cultural, social and economic benefits of the digital society. That's already been talked about in the past. Uh, but as I say, the ambitions that you have of ensuring that there is alignment across the sector and across the area. Uh, can I ask about the confidence of, of ensuring that we get that, that personal data and the, the, the law that requires that to be the case? Because my basic understanding of that at the moment is that there are still some complexities about trying to achieve that. Uh, and, it, and it may be difficult to align some of that uh, going forward, uh, depending on the, the barriers and the, the areas of, of, of difficulty that may be approached or may be received, depending on where we can take that. Yeah. Well, this is a very complex area, and Mr Stewart's absolutely right to highlight that. I would say, however, though, that the European Union is, is one of the only bodies in the world with the scale and the heft uh, to be able to come up with 
uh, frameworks for some of these really big challenges um, because they are a match for other trading blocks or for um, particular economic uh, interests. And so we have to watch very closely what European colleagues are doing in this area because I think uh, for all of those of us who want the highest standards in, in these areas and others, um, I think we can invest some confidence that they will be doing a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And it, it makes the, the case for why alignment is is of, of import, quite apart from the, 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 um, the, 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 the sense of remaining aligned uh, so that when we return to the European Union, it is as seamless uh, as possible. And the digital area is exceptionally complex. Um, I'm sure Mr Stewart saw the... Um, coverage of the recent conference hosted by the UK government, in, uh, which unfortunately uh, Scotland was not present, present at, um, on AI. Um, and so everybody's having to think about uh, how do we pr approach all of this, have the appropriate legal and, and other safeguards, and we'll be working very closely with European colleagues to make sure that it is, it's fit for purpose here as well. Is that happy with that? Yep. Thank you. Um, Mr. Um, thanks very much. I listened to the exchange between yourself and Kate Forbes and the mention of common sense, and I wonder if that makes you the Scottish Government's Minister for Common Sense. That seems to be a fashion these days to appoint such ministers. But I, I wondered two, two points. First of all, you mentioned about accession, and accession is often portrayed as solidifying um, alignment. However, it's also true, as with Maastricht, it, it also solidifies um, diver uh, divergence as well. So, you know, the Danish second home, so the UK opt-out from the social chapter. Um, personally, I would be quite happy to see an opt-out on... If it was the case that the EU was uh, proceeding with Gene Eddington to see an opt-out there. But just to make that point, because we, we sometimes get the wrong impression of what alignment actually means. But given what you said about the, the UK Parliament and the volume of work and the resources devoted to it for legal advisers. And I think a fairly common academic assumption is that there is a real, um, uh, there was a real lack of genuine scrutiny beyond perhaps the House of Lords of European legislation. Are we not setting ourselves up here for trying to do far too much? Um, you mentioned about trying to look across the whole scope. Uh, and would it be better, and maybe this has been done already because I'm fairly new to the committee, mm -hmm. But for the government and the committee to agree what was relevant um, and thereby make it much more focused, as long as those areas which weren't covered, either this committee or individual members could ask for information on that. But would it not be better to be more proportionate and focused on those areas more likely to be of interest to both Scotland and this committee, um, making it easier on officials, given the, the breadth of stuff that they could be doing? I couldn't agree more. I mean, that, that is the point that I have made prior to Mr Brown's um, membership of the, the committee, that there is a danger in saying we require everything um, in its raw format, unprocessed, unassessed, uh, without prioritisation, without the, um, the help of expert advisors or clerks or academics in being able to assess the importance of, of um, a regulation, a directive, and, and so on. Um, and so I think having a SIFT process is a good thing. Um, but I think having that operate in a way that can give individual committee members or different subject committees of the parliament the opportunity in good time, and there, there's the key factor, in good time, to be able to influence the government's thinking um, uh, and the legislative programme as well, there, because there may be um, legislative instruments that are, are at play uh, to be able to, for, for you as parliamentarians and as a committee collectively, to be able to discharge your responsibilities. So I think, I think the injunction for proportionality is absolutely key in this. Will we get that right all of the time? Probably not because of the volume of material that there is, but because of the way in which we are doing this, both looking back, looking at what is happening presently and what is happening in the future, one can, as you know, Mr Ruskell's example, specific uh, example on legislation, allow one to take evidence in good time to, to draw down more information and satisfy yourselves 
that you have done everything that you think is necessary and proportionate. And we're trying to do exactly the same. But I think the fact that there's an, there's an open channel between officials and clerks of the committee, I think is all, also very helpful because it shouldn't, we shouldn't be satisfying um, uh, your demands as a committee just from evidence session to evidence session. It should be ongoing. You should be aware of things that are happening in the meantime. Um, and we should be aware if you have specific uh, issues where, I don't know, Mr Cameron's question was a good example of that, wanted to know something about it. Technical, I don't have that. I have a very big folder. I don't have information on that. I would like to be able to furnish that information. But if we can get that process working well, um, then questions will be answered, hopefully. Um, but if more information is required, it can happen in good time as part of your ongoing um, uh, your ongoing investigations and inquiries as a committee? Yeah, I suppose it's that distinction between the obligations the government has to be able to look across the whole scope of things, but really between the government and this committee, if you can get an agreed um, position where you've got more relevance and less uh, volume, I think that would be good. W one last little point, just to say that you mentioned in response to Mark Ruskell the idea of, I think it was, how we talk to the EU ourselves. Um, that's obviously the source of much of this legislation and so on. Um, you may be aware this um, parliament, this committee, has nomination to things like the um, CLARI, which I've been nominated to, or the proximity group, whatever it's called, to the Committee of the Regions. Um, however, we will not have a member on that for many months to come, um, which I think undermines this committee, this parliament's ability to have those direct conversations and I don't know whether it's proper to do so. I know the committee clerks are working on this, whether the government could try and prevail upon the UK government to make sure that's speeded up as quickly as possible. So yes, we will do that. Um, Mr Brown will report back. I think we have to use every route in that we can. We have, um, many of you will have, have met Martin Johnson and members of the team in, in Scotland House. Um, who are very, very capable at um, reaching both um, legislators, uh, legislators, and you know we are in a fortunate position. There is a Friends of Scotland group in the European Parliament, which is which crosses the mainstream uh, political um, families in the uh, in the Parliament. So you know if there are, are members who are uh, wanting to speak with uh, colleagues in the EPP or um, in the um, Party of European Socialists and Social Democrats. Um, uh, the Greens and, and, and IFA for, for others. Um, there are routes in through the Scottish, uh, through the European Parliament. There are routes in through uh, the Commission, and it's one of the reasons why we have um, conversations with um, uh, other governments, both at a, a, a federal and at a state level, because. Um, we want to have open channels of communication, so if there are things that we, we feel that we should raise, we will raise them, and not being present is a problem. None of this, though, is a, is a substitute for doing what every other normal country does, which is to sit in the Council of Ministers and be part of the discussions about what is uh, happening in the European Union, having a nominated commissioner from this country sitting in the Commission of the European Union, or indeed having our full complement of members in the European Parliament making the laws which will impact on it. The only way to do that is to be a member state of the European Union, because sitting outside in the cold, which is where we are, means that we're having to find workarounds um, uh, because uh, Brexit has uh, brought about a circumstance where we are no longer part of the decision-making uh, structures of the, the EU. So we will try our best, but there is no substitute for um, the, the, the proper way of doing it. Thanks, thanks convener. I too uh, thank the clerks and the officials for their work in, in producing these reports. Um, I just wanted to follow up the, the questions from Kate Forbes and Donald Cameron in relation to the, the tests in general that the Scottish Government is applying in terms of EU alignment. Um, you mentioned earlier about where appropriate, meaning where possible and where meaningful, and talked about meaningful yep. having no impact. But I think obviously in the, in the course this morning we've discussed an example of gene editing in terms of whether that would be desirable or not, and issues raised by Kate Forbes about whether provisions could, would be actually in our, our national interest. Yep. So in addition to whether it's possible or whether meaningful, just to, you mentioned common sense there earlier. Surely there's also a, you know, an element, a test here of whether actually the Scottish Government agree with the proposals? Of course, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 
And, you know, perhaps there will be examples that come along where, we, where one doesn't. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I think, that, again, it's a good illustration, Mr. Bibby's point, about of having an awareness of where these things come about. And then members will be able to question me or colleagues about the thought process that has come to the stage of saying, well, this is why we are or are not or are unable to, um, uh, to, to proceed with things. And... You know, the point's well made, and that's why we're doing this, because it's about being as well sighted as we can in the best, most timious way, uh, and then to be able to ask those very questions. I totally agree. Thanks. Thank you. Um, just a final thought for me is, is also to put on record, um, I, as committee convener, thanks of um, the committee to um, the officials, to our clerks, to our colleagues on SPICE and to Dr Whitten for their work in getting us to this yeah, significant yeah. progress that has been made to date. So thank you. Yeah. I'll now suspend uh, momentarily to allow officials to change over. <laughs> okay, uh, well, <laughs> oh, I welcome back, Cabinet Secretary, and a just reminder that um, we have no flexibility in time in this, and we have some other agenda items to get through this morning. Uh, but thank you, um, and uh, we now move to our third agenda item, which is consideration of draft statutory instrument, retained EU law, Revocation and Reform Act 2023, Consequential Amendments, Scotland Regulations 2023. Following the evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary and his officials, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion for the committee to recommend that the instrument be approved. I remind members that the Scottish Government officials can speak under agenda, this agenda item, but not in the next agenda item. And I welcome back to committee Angus Robertson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Constitution, for the Constitution, Excellent Affairs and Culture, and supported by Greg Walker, Retained EU Law Act Management Lead, and David McLennan, Lawyer for the Scottish Government. And can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Good to be back. Um, the instrument before the committee uh, today is a technical one to update the devolved statute book for the new legal concept of assimilated law, which will become the new name for retained European Union law under the Retained EU Law Act. This change takes effect at the end of the year and cannot be prevented. Therefore, as a responsible government, we want to ensure that there is maximal clarity in devolved primary and secondary legislation. This is the only SSI laid by the government under the Rule Act to date, and the government has no plans to use Rule, uh, to use rule Act powers to alter policy. The range of policy areas touched on in the SSI, from aquaculture and fisheries to waste management, shows the potential of the Rule Act to affect the full panoply of devolved competences. This committee's recent report, How Devolution is Changing Post-EU, found that the Rule Act, like the UK Internal Market Act, represents, and I quote, a significant shift in the constitutional landscape. I can assure members that the government is treating the Rule Act as such. We are committed to protecting devolved interests in the management of UK statutory instrument proposals, and where powers allow, and it is appropriate to do so, we will seek to legislate in this parliament, and that is why we are bringing an SSI forward. 
I wish to touch on the report of the Delegate Powers and Law Reform Committee as issued, which draws the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground E, in that there appears to be a doubt whether paragraph 3 of the schedule is intra virus. That paragraph amends the Freedom of Information Scotland Act 2002 so that the phrase EU obligation becomes assimilated obligation. I note the position of the Delegated Powers Committee in their report last week on the SSI, but I remain of the view that all aspects of the SSI are within the enabling powers and are good law. So I do not propose to withdraw and relay the instrument to exclude the necessary Freedom of Information amendments, and where out-of-date EU terminology stands on the statute book, it is appropriate that such cases are remedied and here an appropriate legislative vehicle has uh, been found to be at hand. So I look forward to the committee's question on what is quite a technical subject, so I'm delighted to be joined by the two leading experts in the field who will be able to answer any of the, uh, uh, any of the technical questions that you may have. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I bring in Mr Cameron, please? Uh, thank you, Kavina. Can I uh, refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, I, you know, I entirely agree uh, with, with, with the position of the Cabinet Secretary. I think it's important that this, um, from my perspective, that this uh, SSI is approved. Can I just ask uh, um, w w why, if, if it's possible to answer this, why this happened? Was it an oversight? Uh, was it just something that slipped through the net? And I don't say that critically because I, I know these things um, often happen. But I'll ask colleagues to follow. I'll just make the general point that um, um, imagine if we were in a parallel world <laughs> where the um, rule legislation, um, as had previously been proposed, were to have gone through. We remember that the sunsetting arrangements had been brought in, and no doubt. Um, were we still to have been in that universe, we would have been sitting here talking about many, many, many SIs and SSIs, uh, and now at least we're in a more fortunate position uh, that we're not. It's, it is the case that there is quite a lot of um, there is quite a lot of reflection about whether these sort of issues touch on, and it's been highlighted to me that there have been three recent cases where people have suggested that it. It may be relevant in relation to employment law or equality law, um, uh, or indeed in relation to Rwanda, which is uh, quite um, uh, is quite current. Um, but the case it is is not. In terms of the specifics of, of the measure, I don't know if David or Gregor wanting to, to add anything. Um, um, thank you, Convener. Um, I think given the scale of the statute book and the challenge of EU exit, it's unsurprising that there may have been missed references in the statute book. But it, I hope it gives members confidence that in quite a large instrument, and colleagues across the Scottish Government teams have been looking at retained EU law quite intensely for some time, there's just one line here. So, uh, per what the Cabinet Secretary's earlier said, you know, where we uncover anomaly, there may be a range of approaches. It may be inconsequential and we leave it. There may be guidance or directions, non-statutory options. But here, we felt that this was comfortably within the enabling powers, general consequential amendment powers, and um, that this legislative vehicle was to hand. I'm not aware of any other anomalies, deficiencies like this. Certainly, it as I think your briefing has made clear, what were known as deficiency powers under the EU Withdrawal Act have now gone. But should any remaining points be um, addressed, it may be that there are other legislative approaches than Rule Act, because as, as the Cabinet Secretary is impressed, there is no appetite to use the wide suite of Rule Act powers that are now available to devolved governments. I'll perhaps invite um, my colleague David to say a little more about that the fact this has come to light now, there has been no practical issue to date, and that this is the appropriate approach to take now. Thank you, Greg. Yes, I think the, the key point with this, this instrument is it's an instrument for updating terminology to reflect a new legislative landscape, and each of the terms in question have to be understood within the legislative framework with which they, they were intended. Um, as a, an EU member state, there were obligations under EU law which attracted the label of uh, an EU obligation. When we left the, the EU, EU law became retained EU law and obligations under retained EU law became known as uh, retained uh, EU obligations. At the end of this year, um, under the Retained EU Law Act, 
retained EU law will become known as assimilated law, and so those obligations will, in course, become known as assimilated obligations, and that's simply what this instrument and that provision of the instrument is, is doing. It's making sure the right label is going to attach to the, the obligations in, in question, and that's why we remain comfortable that we're able to do it with the, the powers in the, in the Rule Act. Thank you. Are there any questions? Further questions? There are no further questions from the committee, so we now formally move to Agenda Item 4, which is a formal debate on the affirmative instrument on which we have just taken evidence. Can I remind the committee members that should not put questions to the Cabinet Secretary during the formal debate. Does any member wish to contribute? Does the Cabinet Secretary wish to add anything? No. Content with the statement that I outlined to the committee. Thank you, Convener. That, that concludes the debate. So, Cabinet Secretary, can I ask you to formally move motion S6M 10876. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that S6M 10876 be approved. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, and that con the committee is content to delegate. Is the committee content to delegate authority to approve a report on the instrument for publication to myself as the deputy, as the convener? Sorry. Thank you. And that concludes consideration of the instrument. And thank you to the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for joining us this morning. And we're just two minutes over time, Cabinet Secretary. So, <laughs> a, a, a good morning. I'm going to suspend briefly to allow witnesses to change over for our next agenda item.
Um, a warm welcome back. Um, we are now moving to agenda item five, which is to take evidence on the challenges of artists' mobility between Scotland and the EU, with a focus on the music industry. The session will inform our inquiry on the review of the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement, as well as our ongoing input to the UK-EU Parliamentary Partnership Assembly in advance of its next meeting in uh, the 4th and 5th of December. So we're joined this morning by Sam Dunkley, Acting Regional Organiser of the Musicians' Union, Alice Black, Scottish Live Events, Branch Broadcasting, Entertainment, Communications and Three Theatre Union, Beck2. Uh, uh, Alice is joining us online this morning. Alistair Mackey, Chief Executive of the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, that is SNO. Ewan Robertson, Board Member of Traditional Arts and Culture Scotland, and Lisa Whittock, Director, Active Events, who is also joining us on on online. Uh, can I begin by inviting each of our witnesses to give a short overview of the challenges experienced by touring artists post-EU exit from, from your own organisation's perspectives? And could I perhaps begin with uh, Ms Whittock? Thank you. Hi there. Um, thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, I'd like to just add that in addition to being the Director of Active Events, I also run um, Showcase Scotland Expo, which is the export office for folk and roots um, music. So I'll be giving evidence in both capacities. Um, I don't think that it will come as any surprise um, to the committee that the challenges since Brexit are increased. Um, and I think it's also important to say, which will also come as no surprise, that in order for there to be professional musicians in Scotland, it is imperative that they earn um, an income out with um, the borders of our country because our nation is simply too small to sustain an income for professional musicians. Um, some of the main challenges are, are obviously in administration. Uh, the Carney uh, situation is an issue, both financially and administratively for artists, and varies widely in what its costs are, depending upon the instruments um, and equipment that need to be listed within that. There is, however, also a challenge with the actual border controls uh, from, from Carneys, and you have a, a random varying um, understanding of the actual officials depending on which airport you go through and that can often cause delays um, and uh, alarm for musicians uh, that operating under a carny system. Um, customs is also an issue and in particular that has seen um, a massive drop in earnings on merchandising for artists because it's much more expensive to bring uh, merchandising into the EU um, and to their, therefore earn from it. And all of this, of course, is hitting artists at a per during the, that perfect storm of increased costs and the challenges um, of um, the current income uh, and economy that we're living in. So those are all those are all challenges. Specifically within the, the Celtic and folk world, however, there's also a challenge um, within uh, the booking of the artists, because if you're an art uh, festival in Denmark, for example, or in France, and you want to book a Celtic artist, um, it's very easy for you to bypass Scotland and to go directly to Ireland um, to, to program a, a, a Celtic artist. So that is a challenge, and that's something that we've been working hard at to try and combat. Um, it's also much harder for new artists um, to break through into Europe. I think it's slightly easier for the more established artists, but for newer artists, it is much harder. And that's partly, I think, because the promoters in Europe <clears throat> have less confidence that younger artists will understand the complexities that are associated with Brexit. Um, and partly because, quite frankly, they don't have the financial um, backing to be able to, <clears throat> to undertake um, journeys into Europe for the first time. There are challenges within vehicle movement, and I'm hoping that, that my colleague Alice is probably going to expand more on this. Um, this is not, I'm not going to talk about cabotage, which, is, which has been widely discussed. I'm going to talk about the issue of insurance. Um, it's not actually even a, a government um, implemented problem or uh, whatever the language is. Essentially, if you're an artist and you want to hire a vehicle to go into Europe, the insurance 
um, in order to be able to hire that vehicle being imposed by the hire companies is so high that you cannot take a vehicle from the UK into mainland Europe. It's just preclusive, preclusive in terms of those private insurance charges. And obviously that has implications for green touring. Um, and it's something that I think, you know, needs to be needs to be uh, desperately looked at. I think I noticed when I was reading the papers that there was some um, outline as to what support currently exists um, for artists. And I think I need to, to, to dispel some myths about that. Um, MEGS, which is mentioned, is not actually a suitable fund for many artists. It is in fact a scheme where you are lent money, but you do not, you, you're given money, but you don't actually receive that money until you have spent it. Um, and you have to then show your receipts. So it actually forces artists into debt and is only really suitable for musicians that are um, supported by London-based record labels. It's certainly not suitable um, for the, the way that Scotland's infrastructure um, is set up. Um, there is also um, <clears throat> the open funds uh, for that's, that's um, managed by Creative Scotland, which I have to say, as everyone knows, is under increasing pressure. And it is by no means um, assured that artists will be supported to tour um, through the open funds. In fact, many um, the, the, the challenges in that fund are so great that I think it's unlikely that many will be. Um, the PRSF fund that is mentioned um, is actually only for showcasing. It's not for touring. And um, there is also the Made in Scotland Onward Touring Fund, which is only applicable to artists that have performed at any of the Edinburgh festivals. There is a national company's um, international touring fund, which of course is not applicable for any of the musicians. So whilst there are resources out there that can potentially help musicians, none of these are suitable for the independent musician. Um, and I think that that is um, a worry. Uh, I think there are certain things that, that can be done and I would invite questions after this because I'm trying to run through this as quickly as possible. And quite honestly, I could be here for at least an hour. Um, the, there, are, there are a number of things that I think can be done that are within the Scottish government's ask. Um, and one of those is to um, continue the discussions and dialogue around developing a music export office, which I think would um, alleviate many of these challenges. It's certainly for emerging artists, if a promoter in Denmark is concerned about booking an emerging or new artist for the first time if they have the confidence that a music export office is there providing the resources and knowledge um, for those artists um, then i think that that would go a long way to helping um, that situation um, i should add that you know I, when i say i run the export office for for scottish folk music i, I would just like to point out that that is very part-time <laughs> So when I refer to a music export office, I mean a fully functioning um, and, and properly funded export office. Um, I also think that in the shorter term, something could be done um, quite quickly, um, and that is to set up a touring fund, similarly either to Made in Scotland or to the National Companies International Touring Fund that is available to help artists um, throughout these times. Um, uh, I... There's a lot more that I could say, obviously, I mean, a cultural touring agreement and lobbying for that um, within the EU, but I understand that that is not um, within the, the give of a Scottish government and is a UK-wide um, ask, but certainly um, a cultural exchange or a cultural touring agreement between e the EU um, and the UK would go a long way to helping that, to helping that situation. I think I'll stop there um, because there's quite a lot in there, um, but I would invite any questions and I'd be happy to to, um, to add any more comments. Should We're going to have opening statements from all the witnesses and then we'll move to questions later. So can I bring in Alice, who's also online? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so much of the, the media attention um, around EU touring focuses on artists, um, but obviously for every musician on a tour, there's several technicians, crew, producers, tour and production managers and drivers um, who, without them, there would be no shows. Um, our members support the artistic vision and make it something that can be seen and heard. Um, and you have to talk about the two in the same breath, really. So you can't have, you know, one cannot exist without the other. Um so our Scottish and UK technical staff are renowned for being some of the most skilled crew in the world. Um, 
you know, many international artists used to begin their tours in the United Kingdom, working with crews within Scotland, hiring equipment and transport from the UK to take into the EU. And now that's become too complex. And because of the 90 day rule for travel, additional paperwork expense for the movement of goods, um, large number of artists and touring companies aren't traveling to the UK anymore and aren't hiring our crew and our equipment and taking that abroad. Um, this also has a knock on impact on, on venues and promoters and um, the equipment hire companies, the trucking companies and transport providers. Um, you know, we were the center point of the live events industry, but I feel like that's now, you know, changed and we're falling behind. Um, the 90 out of 180 day rule for travel has a real impact on our members. Um, you know, we've had just like personal stories of people being unable to holiday with their family because they're concerned about using up some of their 90 days um, and not having enough time left if they're offered a tour to be able to take it. Um, so, you know, it has an impact not just on our members, but also on on their families, uh, you know, and yeah, a wider impact than just the financial um, aspect. Um yeah, what we kind of, I think what we would like to see, um, you know, as much of what Lisa just mentioned in terms of, um, you know, a, a specific mention in the trade and cooperation agreement for cultural workers, uh, a waiver, you know, for visas and for, you know, uh, travel. Um, I know we've got a lot of bilateral agreements with specific com countries within the European Union, but that is complex with different rules applying to different countries um, and you know, it's for individuals and sole, sole traders who are trying to navigate that. It's a lot of additional time they have to spend um, working all of that out. Um, there's also, so again, carnets and the issue of, you know, there's exemptions for musical instruments. Um, now, our technicians travel with, for example, a lighting desk, and there's no exemption for that. So again, there's additional costs, paperwork and time that people are having to, you know, spend now, which they didn't previously in order to take the tools that they need for their job, um, you know, into the EU. Um, yeah, I guess I can probably leave it there for now and, and take any more questions later. But I think, yeah, much of the, much of the, just to summarise, much of the, um, impact on artists is, is the same for our members in, you know, more technical uh, roles. Thank you. Um, Ewan, do you want to go first? Thanks. Sure. Um, I, as, as well as being a, a new board member for Traditional Arts and Culture Scotland, I'm also a touring musician with a, a folk group, so I have direct experience of uh, pre-Brexit and post-Brexit touring. So I, if it's okay, I would just give you a little bit of a snapshot of, of, of our experience. Um, some of the challenges, the main challenge is loss of bookings. Um, the 2018, we had 37 shows in, in the EU. In 2019, we played 61 shows in the EU. Um, in 2022, we played four shows in the EU. And in 2023, We've managed to play 12 shows so obviously there's other um issues going on surrounding covid but but when we look at um <clears throat> our other territories that we tour in we've seen similar we're back to similar levels of, of uh, concerts in, in the uk and we've actually seen a slight increase in other territories like north america um i've spoken to different eu agents that we that we work with and they have reported problems in terms of ad admin and they've been finding that bands simply don't want to, to come and tour. So I know that that's a bit vague, but there's certainly a reluctance for, for those agents to engage with Scottish artists. Um, it's becoming increasingly hard to, to make a profit um, due, due to rising costs. I think it's important to mention, I, I spoke with another uh, group, Scary Vore, who are a, a flagship Scottish band, and they've just completed a European tour, and they didn't actually break even on that tour. And again, rising costs, but one of the main issues with the rising costs was the amount of money they were spending on their carny. Um, so the, there's also a lot of challenges surrounding merchandising. Um, We've had reports of bands losing up to 72% of online sales to the EU. Um, travel challenges in terms of missing flight connections, being held up at customs, and the implication that that has. Um, 
And there's again, uh, Alice mentioned time time problems in, in terms of working with with, with our families. Uh, in, in the band that I play with, we have three of us have, have young families, and if we have to explore other territories to work, it means more travel, more time away from home, uh, and, and more cost. So that's that's certainly difficult. Um, yeah, I'm probably just repeating a lot of what's what's going to be said and what's already been said. But um, the, I think it's important to say that there is definitely a fabulous network of venues and promoters, and there's a huge passion and demand for Scottish music and culture. But it's just becoming increasingly more difficult to access, and there's an increased workload, increased expenditure, and moving forward, I think we just have to look to other territories, which is a great shame. Thanks. Yeah, um, I'll try not to repeat what, what's been said already, but um, <clears throat> the RSN Award will be doing 13 performances in Europe uh, this year. And maybe I can just start by saying some of the challenges that existed before Brexit touring an orchestra from Scotland. We went to Salzburg three weeks ago with 110 musicians. There are so few flights out of Scotland compared to London. For example, we have to put our musicians on multiple flights. We suffer from dynamic pricing models. So at the cheap end, we might have a return flight to Salzburg for 300 quid. For the last 10 or 20 musicians, we're up at 1,000 pounds. That's just a, a, a geographical point, but that's a, a background to how much more expensive it is. Because we're almost always taking two flights to our first touring venue, Unlike a London orchestra, which will travel on the day of its first concert 95% of the time, we always have to travel a day before. We can't trust flight connections. We can't trust passport delays. It's been mentioned already. It's a huge factor. Now, going 100 people through a passport control, it takes a lot of time. So um, even before Brexit, there were additional expenses touring a Scottish orchestra as opposed to a London orchestra. On top of that, now we've mentioned carnage, we've mentioned cabotage. Let me just give you some detail. Cabotage costs us about an extra £15,000. That's bringing a lorry from Europe to Glasgow to Europe, back to Glasgow, back to Europe. Rather than taking our own lorry, it's £15,000 extra. Additional carne costs are about £10,000 for us now for each visit we, we, we go to Europe. Um, I do think touring is crucially important. For the National Orchestra, I think it has real reputational gain for the orchestra and for Scotland as a whole. Um, most major cities, most countries have orchestras that are flagship cultural institutions and touring them is a crucial part of articulating what's happening back at home in your country. So I do think it's crucially important. One other background, um, I spent 23 years in the London Orchestra and the Philharmonia Orchestra. Um, a London Orchestra gets about 20% of its turnover in public subsidy. That's independent of tax credits. In Scotland, we get nearly 40%. Uh, 40 sorry. That's much less than it used to be. But really, London orchestras are able to build a business model where touring is an absolutely crucial income generator for them. Um, I would like to think that the RSNO can be in Europe enough that we can build a similar model, because if we're not in Europe enough, we don't build the reputation to get into the large halls to get the higher fees. Now, the tour that we are doing in January 24, as opposed to the tour we did in April 22, we're getting 14% higher fees than we did. That's because we're committed to going to Europe, we're building reputation, we're building fees, we're going to bigger halls. I'd like that trajectory to continue. I think eventually we could get to a point where touring was a key business, uh, you know, a key part of our turnover, but we're not going to get there unless we're in Europe often enough, and we can't do that at the moment and break even. So the International Touring Fund has been mentioned, and um, I'd like to say something on that on behalf of the national companies. We could not tour without that fund. It's absolutely crucial. But we have to tie down touring dates about two years out. And for example, we will get some support for Salzburg in October. We'll get some support in January. That support was confirmed two weeks ago with us after we'd been to Salzburg and uh, you know, after all our concerts in January are contracted. So it, it is invaluable. It allows us to tour, but it's, it's so uncertain at the moment that I'm finding it difficult to commit to future European tours without some certainty that we'll have that funding. All our finances are so tight, as you know, at the moment, adding in a potential uh, significant loss on touring is, is quite hard to justify. 
Um, maybe I can just talk as well about, about, about inward. We, we have always depended to some extent on European musicians coming to Scotland. It allows us to present an international season. It allows us to maintain a world-class orchestra. But I checked our numbers this morning, and the RSNO has 108 British members, only eight European members now, and one non-European member. And I can tell you, compared to London Orchestra, that's dramatically different. Now, that is partly the complexities of Brexit, the visas, the cost of visas, NHS surcharges, all the things that are additional. But it is also a funding issue that we now pay so much less than other UK orchestras, and we pay less than European orchestras. And, I mean, if you could just compare it to a top sports team, a top football team, of course, I mean, we, we need to access the European labour market to get the very best musicians, to keep the national orchestra at a really international level. And the combination of low salaries plus the increased complexity and costs of visa is making it extremely difficult to recruit outside of the UK. And while at the moment I don't believe that's had an impact on the level of the orchestra, I think it's inevitable that through time we will. Um, maybe I could say something in a, a more positive anecdotal note. Um, I think there's a lot of negative feeling towards UK after Brexit and towards UK culture, orchestras after Brexit. Everywhere we went as a Scottish orchestra, we have been warmly welcomed. And um, I think that's an important statement for Scotland to make, and, 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 and I wanted to report, report that back. But um, we, we would like to be in Europe more. What I'm hearing again, almost everywhere we've been, we've been re-invited to. But what I hear again is we were surprised how good you were. I don't want anyone, anyone to be surprised by the level of culture in Scotland. And the reason the surprise is because we're just not there enough. And we're just not there enough because of the financial challenges of being there. And these financial challenges have just increased after, after Brexit. They were already challenging before. So um, I really appreciate the chance to come and tell you my woes, um, but also to say just how crucially important I think it is that Scottish cultural institutions, bands, orchestras, theatres, opera houses are in Europe, and we're letting people know just how good what's going on here is. Tom. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me um, The experience that we have as the Musicians Union is similar to that that you've heard already, so I'll try not to repeat too much. But, again, to give some context, before Brexit, the enquiries that we got from members, from musicians about working in Europe, were very similar to the enquiries that we still get about working in the UK. They were about contracts and fees, um, insurance and transport. The enquiries we get now are about uh, visas and work permits, often about carnets, and it's because the majority of our members are individual musicians who are being asked to navigate incredibly complex systems um, that almost by default are not user-friendly. They're not designed to be user-friendly. Um, there are added costs for our members uh, with carnets and with uh, visas. There is added complexity of being able to just go to work and make a living. And that combination makes it, for a lot of musicians, not a financially viable option anymore uh, to go and tour in Europe. This, in music, this is music. Uh, a report from earlier this year said that 82% of those who responded to their survey uh, had said their earnings had decreased, their European earnings had decreased. 65% were re receiving fewer invitations to perform in the EU and 57% said it wasn't possible to take up invitations due to increased costs. I had a member in touch last month who was, be, who was asking you know, whether the fee they'd been offered for a gig in Europe was reasonable. And by the time we talked it through, we worked out they'd end up with about 50 pounds and they'd be there for three or four days. And that's just not, that's not viable. A lot of independent musicians before Brexit were learning their trade and adding to the richness of their practice by performing in Europe, by being able to go and perform with musicians who weren't from the same nation as them, to be able to experience different culture, different audiences, and a different way of performing. And that option is not open now to too many musicians. Um, 
as a union to try and support our members, we've created a new post, uh, which came into effect just after Brexit. Uh, we now have a head of international who leads on these issues and works with uh, the International Federation of Musicians, which is effectively a union of musicians' unions from around the world, who are able to lobby governments in Europe, as well as us lobbying governments in the UK and in the nations within the UK. Um, that has got us somewhere, but there's still a, a lot of inconsistency between the different nations, um, and that really presents our members with challenges. We were really uh, pleased to see the paragraph in the UK EU Domestic Advisory Group's uh, report on the 6th of November, which states a commitment almost, or an understanding that a cultural visa waiver should be creative, created for creative workers, which we've been lobbying for since Brexit. And we've said, as, as Alice has mentioned, should include musicians, but also music workers. Because without the technicians and the supporting roles, it's really difficult for musicians to do their work. So we, we support the UK Music Manifesto for Music, uh, which calls for a cultural touring agreement, and for the Music Export Office, which has been mentioned by Lisa previously. So I don't want to take up time repeating things that have been said. I echo everything that's been said so far. Um, and I'm happy to talk further if uh, members have questions. Thank you. If, if I could ask a question before moving to um, the committee members. Uh, so um, myself and my deputy convener sit as observers on the PPA. Uh, and th this will be discussed at the PPA in uh, December. Uh, and I was also al uh, allowed <laughs> to take part in a breakout session on touring artists the last time we were in London. And my impression, uh, rightly or wrongly, my impression is that they, they're having a focus on emerging artists, which they, and an assumption that lots of them will be young people. Uh, and I just wondered what you thought of of the demographics of, of the areas that you're working in and and if that's a right priority or you think it would make any difference at all to the larger sectors that you're all working in. If I go in reverse again, I'll go to you first on this one, Sam. I think musicians emerge at different ages, at different stages of, of life, because we have different pressures and different priorities. We have members uh, who are still in study and we have members who are past the retirement age and all of them face the same barriers. I think the difference isn't necessarily around age, it's around the scale of support and infrastructure that's around you as a musician. If you're touring arenas and have production companies behind you and record labels behind you, you are better able to deal with these barriers than individual artists. Um, and I think the focus should be around scale, really, rather than career stage or age. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe I can just say from personal experience, when I left university, uh, there wasn't a job. I was a trumpet player. There wasn't a job in a UK orchestra for 18 months for a trumpet player. I had no additions to do. I had no opportunities to try and get a foot through the door. So I, I took the chance to go and work in Paris. It was very straightforward. Um, when I came back to the UK, I got married. I came back as a freelance musician and a huge amount of my income was just by dotting over to Europe and playing for small ensembles in Europe. I wasn't an international artist. I was an orchestral player. Uh, that, that options that I took as a young trumpet player are so much more difficult now. Apart from anything, I don't think an orchestra in Paris now would probably advertise in the UK for a musician. Um, you know, so it's, it, it, it is so much, it takes a long while. It took me my first position in a UK orchestra, I was 28. I left university at 21, so I had seven years of trying to build my skills to a point where I could, I could win a position in an orchestra. And uh, European income, European travel was, was a huge part of staying afloat until I had the security of... Uh, a position in orchestra. So yes, I think for young people, you need to be fleet of foot, you know, you need to take every opportunity that comes and the opportunities have diminished post Brexit for young orchestral players. Ewan? Yeah, <clears throat> I, think, I think there's a, an expectation that perhaps more established bands are in a stronger position to be touring in the UK, but my personal experience would be that's not, not the case. It's, it's actually 
it's even more difficult. You know, we've been taking steps backwards <coughs> rather than forwards of late. To, to give you an example, we, we, our last tour, which was, was a 10-day tour in Germany, we had to cut costs in order to make sure the tour was profitable. And we weren't able to take a sound engineer with us, um, which, you know, put, we put our faith in engineer. Well, first of all, we, we weren't able to employ a music worker, and uh, so that impacts them. But also, it puts your own... You're not giving the best portrayal of yourself on an international stage because you're, you're taking a chance. And, uh, yeah, it's a diff difficult situation. OK. Um, we've come to Alice. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, I, I mean, I agree with what's been said already, really, where, uh, you know, it, it does affect members of all ages and stages in their careers, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's a particular challenge for younger workers who can no longer enjoy and gain experience from touring the EU in the way that I did when I first started out in my career. Um, you know, it's 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 a real benefit for people to be able to go and experience that and to bring back knowledge and skills to the industry in Scotland as well. Um, there is also, I think it's, you know, it's putting people off joining the industry as well, to be honest. Um, and in many technical roles at the moment, we have, you know, severe skill shortages, um, you know, and we need to try and encourage people to come and join the industry. And part of that is, you know, the experience that you get from, you know, uh, touring the EU, um, you know, which is no longer as easy as it used to be. Um, yeah, I'd also say that, you know, people move like as we learned during the pandemic, lots of our workers have transferable skills and they were able to move into other areas of the industry um, and, you know, and, and, and work there. Um, and I guess, yeah, so we do have quite a lot of movement um, from people coming into this industry who maybe have been an electrician and then I want to become a lighting technician. And that can be at, you know, any stage in their in their career, in their life. So I think there are particular challenges for younger pe people, but it does, you know, impact on, you know, everyone really in the industry. Okay, Lisa. Hi, hi. Um, I think, uh, I would agree with with what everyone has said. I think it's it's often quite dangerous um, uh, to say, OK, we're going to provide this solution by providing funding for young people. I see that a lot, um, but it doesn't it's not strategic and it doesn't actually deal like, with the, the crux of the issue, which is if you are a band and say, for example, in Scotland, you may you may be selling 1500 tickets, um, but you've never played in France. Right? You need to be able to access that market and to be able to build an audience there in order to have a sustainable career. And I would say this, there is a lot of investment, quite rightly so, um, particularly in Scotland and youth music initiatives. And I think that that's great. But without those young artists having their peers and seeing that there is a pathway to having a successful international career, they will not be inspired to take up careers as professional musicians. Um, so I think that it actually needs to be a strategic approach and you need to look at what the solutions are to each artist at each stage of their career and not assume just because a band may have you know, significant success in Scotland, that does not mean that they're safe. Um, as professional musicians. Um, and I think, you know, as I say, I think a more rounded approach looking at the, the challenges overall is what I would suggest. Thank you. Ms Forbes. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for coming. And can I just start by agreeing with uh, Alistair Mackey that it's absolutely critical that Scottish music is in Europe. And, you know, I think we're all very proud of Scotland's musical culture and heritage. And it's key for everything else associated with Scotland's reputation. So your success in Europe has an economic impact, it has a social impact, it has um, a demographic impact. Uh, and I think the comment that Mr Robertson made that Scary Vore did not even break even just illustrates just how critical uh, this is. And we're only a couple of years post-Brexit. So I want to focus on what this committee can call for or can do to try and relieve some of the pressures that touring musicians are uh, dealing with, apart from the obvious, which is uh, reversing Brexit, which this committee cannot do uh, single-handedly. So there's been talk about funding. There's been talk about technical changes to the rules around transporting equipment, merchandise um, and artists into and around the EU. But I wonder what your answer would be to that. 
where can we make the biggest, most impactful change in order to try and resolve this? Because right now, it strikes me that it doesn't sound very sustainable. And if, as I've said, the stakes are so high in terms of ensuring you can tour, what is it that you think we, in our devolved capacity, could do that would make the biggest difference? You do you want to go first and say <laughs> Richard's getting bored and your evidence? I, I, I think the some kind of waiver on the Carney because that's definitely a cost that's just come from you know directly from Brexit. So it's it's definitely something that we didn't have to consider before and it's a significant cost. All the other costs are rising rising anyway, but if the, if there was some kind of waiver system um that could prevent us having to to go th to go through that, the, the the time it takes, the confusion it causes, and and the money it, the money it takes, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can say that. I mean, the carnies. Um, I remember a trip back from Japan when someone put a hanky in the violin case, and the whole lorry was emptied because a hanky wasn't a silk hanky, right enough. <laughs> it wasn't on the carney. So, if there was some kind of value, so anything beneath. I don't know, £500 or something wasn't required. I don't know if that's possible, but it's the complexity of the carney which takes so much time and money. I, I mean, I would love... I understand the cabotage, the exemption wasn't refused. I understand it just wasn't pressed for. And, and I don't really understand the politics of this, why we can't retrospectively push to have cultural exemption for the cabotage rules. You know, I mean, we invested in a lorry that's a modern engine that's, that's got a low-carbon footprint. And yet we're having to hire a haulier from Europe. We've no idea what that carbon footprint is. Additional expenses, you know, it's, it's a nightmare. But I mean, I wish I wish I could give you a really compelling thing for this committee to do. I, I, I fear the biggest problem to touring is this perception of complexity from European promoters and a general negativity towards UK post Brexit. But what I would say is, I think it's even more compelling, as you say, that we should be in Europe because of that, to fight that, you know, to, to fight for Scotland's reputation and place. I think culture has a leading role to play. So, I mean, I mean, Brexit was such a huge hit for, 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 the, for the music industry and for touring. There is no mitigation that I could suggest. There are things that would help make it easier, that would increase, decrease our costs and complexity. But like I say, I think that's even more compelling reason to, to fight through and to get there more and more. Sam, do you want to come next? Yeah, I think... I think a lot of the costs come from the administrative burdens and the and the fees that are charged around that uh, for carnets and, and all the rest of it. So I think the idea of music export office that is UK wide is is the aspiration. But I wonder if there's a potential to create one that serves Scotland and musicians in Scotland in the short term um, to try and support musicians at whatever stage of their career in dealing with the bureaucracy that they're coming up against, to make sure that they are supported in that and have access to experts and potentially funding to offset some of those costs that are coming, falling on them now that aren't necessarily of their making, but they're costs that weren't there before Brexit. So potentially, is there capacity to create a fund that can, that can pay for some of these costs for artists touring to Europe? Um, I think in the long term we will continue as a union lobbying for a cultural worker visa uh, and anything the committee can do to lobby for that as well would be massively appreciated. Um, but again, I'm not sure there are quick fix solutions, but if there's something that can happen in Scotland to support Scottish musicians, uh, we would be all for that. Hi, um, I'd just like to echo um, what Sam has said. I mean, obviously, the committee can can lobby um, for for waivers, um, etc. But the, the the question was, what can the Scottish government do now? Um, uh, in the longer term, an export office, the Scottish Music Export Office, focusing on the specific needs of Scottish artists is is ultimately the aim. Um, 
I, for one, would prefer prefer to see that um, as opposed to Scotland being consumed by a UK music export office because that worries me. Um, so I'd much prefer uh, us to lobby for a Scottish music export office. But in the short term, and, and I mean now, um, uh, there really needs to be an international touring fund set up to, to help artists um, uh, be able to access these new territories. Um, you know, you and Rob, Robertson quite, quite rightly said that, you know, due to the complexities and difficulties within Europe, artists are, are now looking to North America. Um, North America is massively expensive to tour, but it's also very, very rewarding. It's always been massively expensive to tour North America. That's not new. Um, the complexities with um, Europe are new. And I do worry that without intervention now, there will be a lot more artists that leave the industry. Um, in our colleagues in the more indie and uh, pop world um, have spoken to me and said that that there are many artists who have just chosen to stop touring um, altogether. They're, they're, they're still releasing albums, they're still recording, but they're no longer touring because it's just not financially practical to do that. And Scotland has a rich cultural heritage. We are seen as... Um, massively punching above our weight in terms of the talent that is um, here in the country. But without intervention to sustain those professional musicians, now I do really worry about the future and I think that we'll see an increasing decline over the next two years. So I would urge the committee to take action now to, re to reverse that. It doesn't need to be a huge amount of money. I welcomed the First Minister's um, announcement about increased funding for culture and arts, um, and I would urge for some of that to at least be released now to deal with the pressing problems that artists currently face. Thank you. And Alice, final word. Yeah, I mean, echoing mu echoing much of what's already um, been been said, really. But um, you know, I think yeah, I agree with campaigning for changes to the EU trade and cooperation agreement to include a free cultural worker permit um, or um, exemption and carne waiver and exemption as well. Um, and I agree, funding to support workers and organisations with the ad additional costs in admin, um, because that's really one of the main barriers that I think the Scottish Government could help with. Um, you know, continuation of the uh, International Touring Fund, the National Performing Companies, supporting the Festival Expo Fund, Creative Scotland, I know they support uh, organisations and individuals to tour internationally with their open fund. So, you know, I guess an increased uh, level of funding to support the kind of international work that those those funds, um, you know, help provide for um, would be would be great. Um, you know, we recently had a five a member had a five week tour cancelled um, because just because of the the international artists got too nervous about around the issues to do with visas and carnets uh, and decided to go with the German supplier instead. So you know, it's just like, yeah, the the impact of those things I think and campaigning around those issues would be would be a great help. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr. Ruskell, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm interested in, in you know, your campaign for a, a cultural touring agreement. I think, Alice, you were just talking there about you know, the TCA review uh, 2026 and, and, and what progress, what discussions you can, you can have ahead of that. Uh, I mean, are there other sectors that kind of link in uh, with touring companies and, and musicians who are, who are facing similar issues where you could potentially work together and I'm just thinking about screen and within the sort of cultural ecology um, whether there are workers uh, you know work in screen and other cultural sectors that are that are, that are you know coming up against similar problems um, and and how you might sort of build the case I guess from there but uh, should go back to Alice on that one no uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. You know, we have we have members who work across a screen theatre, and it and it impacts it impacts on all of them. <laughs> you know, it's it's absolutely not restricted to just music. I mean, I was having a conversation with colleagues at the National Theatre. I, I, my day job is in National Theatre of Scotland. Um, partly and also freelancing the music industry and I was having a conversation with people at National Theatre GB and they were saying basically 
uh, War Horse, which was obviously one of their huge international touring productions, just would not be possible now with the additional costs and uh, the restrictions on the amount of time they could spend in the EU and all of that. And if big operators with, you know, the level of resource capacity and staffing like National Theatre can't manage it, then, you know, how are the, how are the smaller companies and arts organisations supposed to, you know? So I think it's, yeah, it's definitely something that's felt across the sector. And back to, you know, we cover all of those areas. So we do, there is a lot of working together and, and discussion happening. But um, yeah, so I think all of us um, working together to pressure for changes to this, um, you know, or a cultural visa waiver um, would be yeah, great. Yeah. Um, would anyone else like to come in? Yeah, Sam. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to say that our head of international, Dave Webster, sits on the advisory board of the Independent Commission on UK-EU Relations, which is an organisation who are releasing reports on lots of sectors in UK life. Um, and they've just their most recent report, I think, was on manufacturing. So it's not just the music industry that's suffering. And and by working with these kind of cross-industry organisations outside of the creative sector, we're, we're seeking to work and find the commonality. Because, as you say, it won't just be musicians and, and those in supporting roles with the, within the music industry who are facing these barriers. Mm -hmm. There'll be professionals across, across the economy, really. Um, and while our focus is on lobbying for that cultural exemption, because that will most benefit our members and, and can either be done, we hope, as part of the, um, the TCA review or as an independent side agreement. We're also working with these other sectors to just make sure that the, the voice of music is heard um, so that if there are larger moves going on, we're not missed out in that. Mm -hmm. Lisa, did you want to come in on this? Or? Uh, just, just briefly. Oh, sorry, I thought it was muted, but I'm unmuted now. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, just briefly, I do think that there, there, there are um, there, there are some issues that are are, are common to to across the the sector. Um, however, um, I would I would like to just stress the the music industry. I do think is unique. Um, I think that, and I welcome the amount of investment that is there for Scottish screen, um, and for the film industry in general. I don't think that that is matched for the music sector. Um, and I think that we need to be careful to make sure that the, the the individual challenges that the music sector faces like are recognised because it is a different industry to screen. Um, so I just like to 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 note that really. Noted. Um, just got a final uh, question. Um, the committee recently uh, went to Ireland, and we were hearing about you know the work that the Irish state does to connect with its diaspora, um, a lot of the cultural work around that. Are you seeing uh, artists and workers um, who've got a, a family connection to Ireland applying for Irish passports? Is that a, is that a workaround in terms of in, you know enabling greater access to to Europe? A lot of musicians that are trying to find a grandfather somewhere in Ireland. Yeah, I mean, right. of course. I mean, apart from anything, you get through airports an hour quicker, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, a lot of individual musicians are, are, are looking to see if they can get dual nationality. Okay, that's interesting. Any other thoughts on that? Again, we, we've had musicians contacting us to, to support them in that process. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning, any, any time we we look at what's happening in the Republic of Ireland is the level of public funding for the arts, which is substantially higher than it is anywhere in the UK. Um, and that just makes a massive difference because it means that the sector can be better funded, that musicians in employed roles can be better paid and we'll, we sit around the table and have friendly discussions about what pay should be for musicians. But we all know that there are challenges because of the level of public funding that organisations get. And it, it makes a difference to how musicians can tour, either with organisations or as individuals, um, to have that level of public funding, which I think, is, last time I looked, was about £20 per head, um, which is, as I say, vastly higher than it is within the UK. I'd like to echo that. Certainly, there are, there are numerous artists that are applying for Irish passports. I mean, that's, that's simply 
just to make things easier in terms of, of touring in Europe. But the level of investment that Culture Ireland um, have um, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and what that does, so for example, if you look at Germany, um, the, there are loads of um, German-Irish touring circuits and they're funded. Um, a lot of the artists are funded to, the travel costs are funded to, to participate in these tours. Um, and they're very successful. They're, they're brilliant at introducing new artists to new audiences. And ironically, some of the time, the artists that are performing on those are Scottish, um, but they're marketed as Irish artists. It's the same thing in the US, like the massive amount of um, Irish uh, festival circuits that are there and are all supported by Culture Ireland um, do also present Scottish artists who the general public think are Irish. Um, and I'm not, I don't think for one minute that this committee or the Scottish government, um, or I wish, I hope they would, um, but I don't think that, that the level of um, support for culture art that Culture Ireland has directly from the Irish government um, will be replicated by the Scottish government. But I do think that it's a good model and it's a good way of looking at it. And I do think that it's interesting because Culture Ireland do not just have um, a responsibility for music, but they do have responsibility for all the arts. So they are able to take a strategic view as to what each art sector sector needs. And that relates back to the last question um, about similar um, similar struggles that the, the sector or, or professionals working across all art forms within the sector face. But yeah, the Culture Ireland model is, is definitely something that's well worth looking at. And I think looking at it, but looking at it in a context of what's right for Scotland um, would be my suggestion. Yeah, well, being mindful of the constraints that we have as well. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, Mr. Bibby. Thank you, convener, and thank you for, um, to the panel for your evidence and also your campaigning efforts on, 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 on these issues. Um, on the issue of a cultural touring agreement, I think it would be remiss um, not to mention that the Shadow Secretary of State uh, for Culture, Media and Support has committed a future Labour government to negotiating an EU-wide cultural touring agreement that would include Carney, Cabotage um, and Customs. Um, I appreciate the evidence we're getting this morning is, you know, there's, there's an urgent need for, for action on this issue. Um, in, in the meantime, you, you've laid out a lot of evidence relating to the impact this is having on, on income, on career progression, um, and a whole range of um, other evidence you've highlighted from, from other organisations in relation to this. Do you think there is a need for um, the UK government to carry out a full long-term assessment of the impact of the current situation um, so there can be greater recognition and, and, and agreement on the need to address this issue? Thank you. <laughs> no, no, look, can I just say that I think there are UK government initiatives which need to help culture. Um, without the cultural tax credits, so many organisations in the UK would not be surviving at the moment. I think there could be more things that can be done through the taxation system. And let me just give you one. For example, if, if, if we could work with UK government to get an employer's national insurance exemption for culture. There's VAT cultural exemptions for tickets. There's tax credits for culture. If, if the problem in this country is 90% are, I believe, of cultural workers are self-employed, they don't have the security of employment because organisations simply can't afford to employ them. And there are all sorts of anomalies that exist within culture. You know, London orchestras are self-employed. They don't pay all the employers' add-ons. I'm in competition with them. <coughs> and as an, as an employer, I've got to pay employers' national insurance. I think if we could model a system with UK government, we could lobby UK government to look at exemption for employers' national insurance, it would bring more cultural workers into employment. Any, any financial gain from organisations could be recycled, um, so the Treasury potentially takes home the same take. But I think there are things in the taxation system as well as the subsidy system, as well as everything else. I don't think any stone should be left unturned in looking at how to support and advance cultural workers. Sam, did you yeah, just, mm -hmm. just very briefly, I think, it's, I think uh, anything that we can do to assess the current situation would be welcomed. I think an important part of that is also looking at, looking at the current situation in the whole. I think we've heard uh, from other witnesses today, and, and 
we know as a union that some musicians have left the industry because of the impact of Brexit, combined with the impact of COVID and all the other stuff that's been going on. Any assessment of the current situation has to find a way of recognising those people who have left and understanding why they've left, which is a really difficult thing to do. But to just take a snapshot of now risks missing an impact that has already been felt by the industry, uh, which I think is a really important narrative alongside what musicians are facing currently. Lisa, did I see you want to come in? It's difficult to yeah. tell on the screen sometimes. Oh, got Alice. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think Alice wants to come in as well, but yeah. just very quickly, um, I, I always welcome um, uh, research, but I don't welcome research like at the expense of ac action, um, because quite often research is used um, as a way of delaying um, any activity. And I would say that in terms of the UK wide situation, there's a lot of research that's already been conducted by UK Music and Live um, and the agents association. There's a lot of research out there already. So yes, I would welcome it, but not at the expense of delaying any um, intervention, which is urgently needed now. Okay, thank you, Alice. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, th I think Lisa kind of m mostly covered off what I was going to say there, where, you know, I, any any more research to find the impact be welcomed. But, you know, I think I think we can already see that it has had a significant impact. And so, you know, what's what's needed kind of urgently is is action. And we absolutely support the, um, you know, what you were saying and. Uh, about the Labour Party uh, position on the cultural touring agreement to include carne exemptions and stuff, and that that would be fantastic. But I think, yeah, whilst more research is welcome, I think we we can see that there has been a significant impact on the industry, and what's needed now is action. <clears throat> okay. Is that you okay, um, Mr. Stewart? You wanted in here. Thank you. You you've you've given us a a very honest but a very stark. Uh, uh, this morning view of the industry that you all represent and you're trying to maintain and sustain. Uh, and without some of these interventions uh, that you're asking for, uh, the industry is at a tipping point, I would suspect, uh, for many of you uh, as to what could and might happen next. Uh, and we've already touched on what may be required uh, to try and get some support, uh, financial, uh, and then possibly uh, the, the timescale for visas were uh, 90, 180 days. I know that's been touched on. Uh, that would give you some hope if there were some areas that, of that likelihood that could be managed and maintained. But what other opportunities do you see, if there are any, uh, in trying to challenge and, and equate where you want to see the sector go? Because at the moment, as I say, the sector is in a, a, a dire situation uh, and, and needs all of that uh, to progress it. Uh, each one of you have talents within your own uh, sector or within your own field. Uh, and, and are you doing anything collectively together uh, in trying to manage or, or, or progress or, or challenge? Uh, we have opportunities here to tackle government. Uh, but are there any within your own sector that are, are, are coming forward with potential solutions to try and see? I know we've, we've heard some of them to this morning, and that's really encouraging. Uh, but are there others, are there other ways, uh, or when you're looking at other parts of the world as to what they try and achieve in a similar or different situation, what they do uh, that we could try and uh, marry into, or we could try and uh, support or, or, or even you know, copy in some ways uh, that, that they do? Uh, or, or does it have to all come from the, the government side of things and from uh, the funding mechanisms that we can control here? Is that, is that really the only opportunities that we have? Maybe if I, if I asked Alistair first. No, look, I mean, I can talk about the RSNO, uh, but every organisation I know has been resourceful and entrepreneurial sure. in trying to balance public subsidy with, with more um, commercial income. But let me tell you what the RSNO is doing. We've, we've invested a million pounds in a facility in Glasgow that allows us to bid for film, television, video game recordings. And I can tell you, Denzel Washington's last film, music was recorded in Glasgow. Sylvester Stallone's last film, music recorded in Glasgow. We had Kevin Costner in the building for five days. That's crucial income. Crucial income. It's not just income. It's putting Scotland's National Orchestra in a global position. Anyone that goes to a cinema, anywhere in the world, to watch these films, 
Scotland's National Orchestra. But what I have to say is the reason we can win, the, 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 these contracts are a game changer for us. The reason we can win these contracts is because we've got a world-class facility and we've got an amazing orchestra. And the reason we've got that is because of Scottish Government support. That's what puts us in the game for that. And without that, we just wouldn't be competitive. And, you know, we're talking about things we could do with visa waivers or carnets. These things are all important. But, I mean, I, mean, and I understand the, the, the funding crisis that we're all facing. But we get more or less the same government subsidy as 2008. Mm. You know, and we are on a cliff edge now. We, I mean, I, I hate to say this to you. We have the lowest starting salary of any UK orchestra. If my colleagues from Scottish Ballet or Scottish Opera were here, they would tell you the same thing. You know, we are running organisations that pay lower salaries than anywhere else in the UK. And how long can we sustain the quality that we are if that continues? And I, and I know that's a blunt thing to say, and I know it's a difficult thing for you. I understand the funding, but I think it's important to say it and not think that we can navigate this with entrepreneurial initiatives or with waivers for European touring, you know? And we, European is a really competitive marketplace for orchestras. If you want to get on the top halls in Europe, you know, you're competing with orchestras from Berlin, from Amsterdam. These orchestras just have way, way more subsidy than we do, you know? Um, and, and that allows them to go for less money with really great musicians. So, I mean, that, that we, look, we are, we are, I want to assure you, and RSNO is not alone, we're trying everything to try and, uh, and generate more income and be more entrepreneurial. And for us, it's film, television. Video game schools was doing that. Any other ones want to add to that, or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so. Musicians are entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. um, we, with Help Musicians, published the Musicians Census early this year that found that the average income of a musician from working in music is twenty thousand and seven hundred pounds a year, so, and that's. 43% of those who responded reported they less than, earned less than £14,000 a year. So musicians, sometimes against their best interests, will make music for the love of the music. We think they should be paid for their work and should be able to make a living. Sometimes the difference between being able to go to Europe and tour or not is whether or not you'll make any music from merch. And if you have to register for VAT in every nation you go to, that's a barrier to going and doing that. It makes it almost impossible. We work uh, with UK Music and with Live and with FIM, who I mentioned earlier, the International Federation of Musicians. Um, we lobby through them on behalf of our members and we listen to our members and encourage them to come to us when they face these challenges so that we're aware, so that we can then come to places like this and report those challenges to you. Um, and I, I don't arrive here today uh, naive enough to think that you in this committee or in this place will be able to solve all the problems that we've outlined but it's really important that we underline those things that you're already aware of and I'm sure you're already aware of much of what we've said today um, we'll continue to lobby uh, here and in Westminster and in Stormont and in Cardiff um, but we're working on behalf of our music uh, musicians and members with as many organizations as as we can and will listen to us and we'll continue to do that Lisa? I, yeah, I'd just like to echo that. Um, I think that, that musicians are resilient and resourceful. Um, and certainly in terms of the, the Showcase Scotland Expo, um, we approach commercial sponsors, we approach PRSF, we look at every revenue stream that there is. Um, and artists do that as well. Um, but, you know, there is a cost of living crisis out there and the commercial sponsorship opportunities um, have waned drastically and um, they just don't exist in the way that they used to um, and I do think I think that the committee should look at you know if you would if you were looking at establishing an international touring fund for musicians and I would just like to say that that does not exist at the moment there are funds out there but just to reiterate that does not exist um, you know musicians are, are not able to access the majority of the funds that, that currently exist for touring um, but if you were to look at doing that it's not, 
it doesn't need to be the situation that you're funding an artist forever because you won't need to. It's looking at providing that seed funding um, for the first two to three tours like of any nation, by which time that tour will be commercially sustainable and that artist will no longer need investment. So it's allowing the resources to be used in a strategic way that intervenes at a critical point in that artist's career. If you look at pre-Brexit, um, a lot of artists didn't apply. Most artists didn't apply to Creative Scotland for tour, tour funding because they didn't need it because the cost of living crisis didn't exist. Brexit didn't exist. And we didn't have that perfect storm of just coming out of COVID. Um, and the sector and the industry is still in recovery from that. So I, I wouldn't want the committee or the Scottish government to look at this and say, oh, this is this. This needs to be something that, you know, every artist for the duration of their career is subsidised to go into international touring. That's not what's needed. It's strategic intervention that is sensibly utilised to maintain the professional artists that we have and to ensure that we have a future of professional mu musicians coming through, which is the bit that I'm really concerned about. Does anyone else want to come in? I can't see Alice on screen, so I don't know if she wants to come in or not. Yep, thank you. I'm about to come. I mean, it's kind of you know. Uh, I guess some of the other some of the other areas of the you know where we are struggling, and I've mentioned already is is skill shortages, and some of the things that you know Beck to have been doing is um, looking at training vocational training for members and trying to you know skill people uh, up to fill those skills gaps um, and helping colleagues with diversifying their income. So you know if they work primarily in music you know, um, training them to be able to work because there's so much cross-pollination of, you know, workers, particularly within technical roles um, amongst, uh, you know, theatres, music, live events, uh, and, uh, you know, helping people with, and screen as well, and helping people with that. However, what we don't want to do is, you know, if people people should be able to have a career in music and that is their, you know, that is their career. Um, but unfortunately, at the moment, due to this, they're kind of having to, you know, uh, try and get money from elsewhere as well, basically. Um, but yeah, I guess that's one of the things that, you know, we are doing is trying to um, help members with getting, you know, uh, training and helping to fill those skills gaps and bring new entrants into the industry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brain. Thank you very much. Um, just thinking back to um, the Brexit debate, there was two scenarios that were laid out. One was that this was going to be sunny uplands, full of opportunity and no regulation, no very little regulation. And on the other side, it was said it would be an enormous act of self-harm. And I'm getting a pretty distinct impression from the sector, which of those two scenarios you feel is being played out. And perhaps this sector, more than any other, shows the folly of cutting yourself off from a huge market right in your doorstep. And it's really quite depressing to hear some of the stories about people that have stopped either their profession um, or, or performing or touring. Um, but I wondered uh, two, two quick questions. One is the extent to which these things were predicted and predictable. If it was possible to know these things were going to happen, or has some of the stuff become apparent subsequently um, to, to an extent? So what kind of proportion, if there can be a guesstimate of that uh, and from any member of the panel? And the second question is a specific one for Lisa. I was quite surprised, and I'm, I'm new to this committee, so maybe this is something that everyone else knows. When you said that um, Scotland was too small a country to sustain full-time musicians, and if that's the case, is there a cut-off in terms of country sizes where you can expect to be able to sustain full-time musicians? Uh, and if there's any idea of what that cut-off, what size of a country would be able to do that? Um, so, it's difficult so. It's difficult to give you uh, the size of a country. Um, but Scotland is a small nation. So, for example, for a musician to sustain a professional income. And I should say that, as Alice quite rightly pointed out, that's not just the musicians, it's the infrastructure, it's the agents and the managers that support them. It's also the technicians that support them. Um, you need to be performing um, full time, uh, you know, more than most of the year, you need to be performing full time to sustain that income. Um, so within Scotland, we really only have um, the major cities that are able to to resource artists performing um, and for artists to achieve an adequate level of income from those concerts, you really only have the major cities that can do that. And if you look at our festival circuit, there are really not very many, um, you know, major, major festivals. 
out with the Edinburgh festivals, which is not really music based um, for musicians. So it's imperative that artists are able to earn a living out with Scotland. Now, in Showcase Scotland Expo, we include exports to mean England, um, Ireland and Wales, um, because that is exporting our artists from Scotland. But it is critically also the European market. And Germany is one of the, the largest um, markets in the world um, for touring and for merchandising sales. And our artists, I mean, you and Robertson indicated um, Scary Boar's situation in terms of coming back from Germany recently, they only just broke even. So it is really, really important to understand that musicians have to be able to, to perform and sell albums outside Scotland in order to maintain a living. And if you look at countries across Europe that are the same size as us, whether that's Norway, Sweden, Finland, all of those um, countries and their governments have a proactive approach to exporting their artists. They have a music export office and they have music export touring funds to support those artists in their certainly in their first ventures um, overseas because we're not the only nation in, in the world that is small I would like to say that I think as I said earlier talent wise we punch above our weight um, and currently our musicians are massively respected in Europe um, so we're not alone in our size but we are alone in that we don't have the same solutions as those other small nations have. Thanks very much. And just for any member of the panel on the idea of what, what has, I suppose, become apparent since Brexit that was perhaps not predicted or predictable beforehand that's had a big effect? Perfectly predictable, you know. I mean, to move freely in Europe as an orchestra, it gives you immense opportunity as an individual. That was predictable. There are things like cabotage, not achieving that exemption. I think we all assumed that would happen. Uh, and that, that was a surprise. The big things, I think, were predictable. There's some small things that I think... Uh, took us by surprise. But can I just add something about the size of the country? I mean, again, for an orchestra, we, there's very few venues that are large enough in Scotland to, to host an orchestra. Historically, Aberdeen, Dundee, you know, these, these large cities, it was the local council that promoted the concerts. And we got direct support from local council or we were hired by the council to present in their halls. That's gone for us now. So even within a small country, the market for us has changed dramatically due to the funding landscape. So it really is a perfect storm. And again, the one great thing about film television music is it's an international marketplace we're going into. Touring is an international marketplace. These things are increasingly uh, crucial to, to balance our, our, our budgets. With recording, you know, we very often have an engineer, a uh, composer in Los Angeles, and we're recording in Glasgow. And we've got fast internet in the centre of Glasgow. We've been very successful at doing that. So there are things we can do to try and mitigate against a declining opportunity within Scotland. But I, I, I would love us to be in Aberdeen as often as we used to be, in Dundee as often as we used to be. We want to be there. It's just the, the support from local councils. They simply don't have the finance to do that anymore. I, I would really like to ask a final question, but I'm, I'm completely out of time. But my thoughts on uh, just, just with Mr Brown's question is, I, is, is it fair to try and compare Scotland as a, you know, a, a, an own state, if you like, in, in terms of um, funding and things? Or should we we should be looking to um, some of the, the, you know, the Basque country, Catalonia, to some of the lenders to see what they're actually doing? Is that would that be a fairer comparison? Um, yes or no answers. Is just okay, all we can could, have. could someone double check the stat? As I understand it, the average. European country, but it's 1.5% of GDP into culture. I believe Scotland puts 0 0.6. So it's not just the size of the country, it's what proportion is assigned for culture. And let me say this, I think culture has huge economic value. I think the cultural sector across it, we are not quite good enough yet at articulating that really clearly. You know, we've got digital outreach through education. What is the economic benefit of all these kids? We've got film scores coming in. What's the economic benefit, not just of the income in dollars, but the reputational gain for Scotland that we're on major film tracks? I think we need to do better on our side at articulating economic benefit. And I think we need to help persuade decision makers of economic benefit of culture. I'm afraid I'm going to have to call on, we have another agenda item. Um, and we don't have any flexibility on a, th on a Thursday because of FMQs. Can I thank you all for, for your um, contributions and the written submissions that you, you've also provided the committee with. And, uh, Thank you very much for that. I'll close this session.